about Latino theater and about growing and the pipeline and everything that is happening with it. We're very excited about that. So thank you for including us in that conversation. Uh, yeah, let's see where else. We started planning this about eight months ago and Rose Cano brought me on board originally. She asked me if I wanted to do this. Put it there. Uh, <laughs> and from there we reached out to people, see who wanted to help us put this together. And an amazing group of people came together. We had meetings twice a week. And it seems like that was just yesterday. And look at us, here we are, and everybody's here, and it's happening. So this is truly exciting. We have a jam-packed schedule for you that you all have in two different portions, the steering committee and, you know, and, and the one in your program. There's a lot of work, there's some fun. So hopefully it'll show you that Seattle has got some fun stuff going on as well. Uh, so take advantage of that. And Rose? Okay. Bienvenidos, and first of all, happy Latino Theater Day in Seattle! <laughs> proclamation, which will be read later today, is Latino Theater Day in Seattle, and we're so happy it coincided, not by chance, with the uh, setting <laughs> So thank you for those of you who have flown and driven and taken the bus and, and come here tonight. Um, I wanted to shift the tone a little bit. We, um, uh, the Latino Theater Commons was formed in this way. Look at this circle around you. Isn't this a beautiful theater? This means everybody in, in this space is together. Everybody's voice is equal. So right now, I am facing north. So I just wanted to invite you, you can stand or sit, to just face north for a second and honor our ancestors and our storytellers and the people who have come before us to the north. Thank you. And then to the south. that have come before us to the west. <coughs> and I would like to honor Chief Seattle, <coughs> Chief Self, and his tribe, the Duwamish, the whole reason that this city is here. I hope. Thank you. Have a seat. So to open up this amazing convening, so we'll be here in this space for the next uh, three days talking about things that are really important to us in our community. I wanted to um, introduce two people that are going to start us off with an amazing poem. First is Jorge Vilches, poeta y pintor, nacido en la Ciudad de México en el DF. Is Jorge Vilches, poet and painter, born in the Distrito Federal of Mexico City. And I also want to honor Jose Carrillo, who will be reading the poem with him. Jose Carrillo is a Mexican, Aztec, American son of the sun, musician, actor, poet, born in Durango, Mexico in 1932, grew up in San Francisco, bachelor's in theater, San Francisco State University. His resume lists over 60 years of performances as an actor in live theater, woodwinds player in Latin jazz bands, writing and performing poetry. He moved from San Francisco to Seattle in 1987, very lucky for us, to be with his two daughters, Lee and Denise, and later his granddaughters, Olivia and Una, Bellas Nietas. And I just wanted to add to Jose's long list of credits that he is the longest continuous practitioner of theater here in the Northwest, as far as we know, if you guys know anyone else. <laughs> um, and that, I don't say that lightly. I mean, I think we really are here about honoring our longevity, our ancestors. It's not that we just arrived a few years ago. I think um, it's really important, the space that he has preserved and held for us. He's been in the struggle, in the lucha, all these years. 
And I'm especially thrilled that he can be here tonight on Latino Theater de Seattle. After many years in the trenches, contando nuestras historias, one of the founders of Seattle Teatro Latino in the 90s, Jose Carrillo. Mm -hmm. We must sleep with open eyes. We must dream with our hands. Soñemos hoyos activos de río buscando su cauce. Sueños de sol, sus mundos soñando. We must dream the dreams of a river seeking its course, of the sun dreaming its worlds. Hay que soñar en voz alta. Hay que cantar. Hasta que el canto eche raíces, tronco, ramas, pájaros, astros. We must dream aloud. We must sing till the song puts forth roots, trunk, branches, birds, stars. Cantar hasta que el canto, hasta que el sueño engendre y brote del costado del dormido la espiga roja de la resurrección. We must sing till a dream engenders in the sleeper's flank the red, the red wheat ear of resurrection. And now we'd like to welcome uh, our wonderful, one of our wonderful, our wonderful hosts here at the University of Washington. He was the artistic director at New York's New Dramatists for 18 years, for 18 seasons. And he is a strong advocate of new works and, and of up and coming playwrights. Uh, he has been with the University of Washington now for two years. Ladies and gentlemen, the executive director, Todd Linden. <laughs> about moving to a new place and a really new world, a different world, it's first of all you have in the round theaters, which are no speaker's dream. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, it's, uh, it's God, just... you work the aisles. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they don't call them vomitoriums for nothing. <laughs> uh, so uh, it, it, one of the things that is so great about this moment is um, I miss so much about my old life in New York, and there are many people here who are part of that old life. So it's really wonderful, and many people here who are part of the new one. So it's kind of a double blessing. So thank you for being here. I have a few things to say, and then introduce our um, next guest. But first, I pulled this off my wall, um, because I have the, this stack of pictures on my wall that includes um, Ibsen, this great photograph of Ibsen, and August Wilson, and this photograph of someone you will recognize, <laughs> Maria yeah. This is a picture taken by Susan Johan for Irene's um, signature season in New York. So we have to figure out a place to put it, but for now I'll just put it here where some people <laughs> um, So, uh, just a few things. First of all, welcome to Seattle. It's a beautiful, if you haven't noticed, it's really a beautiful place. Get out a little bit this weekend. See the mountains, they're all around us. The water, the trees, this campus is gorgeous. Just take breaks and go for walks. Um, and then move here. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's really what we, this is about creating critical mass for Latina and Latino theater in uh, Seattle. I guess that, that's really true. <laughs> Uh, we have a new president at this university who um, would be here if she could, and 
uh, is really happy that this is happening. And it's not just a, a, the rarity that we have a woman president at a large state university, but we have a Cuban-born out lesbian woman president. Oh. <laughs> and um, so this is, a, this is a project that's truly near and dear to her heart, and I just wanted to communicate that. Um, we're also here um, because of accidental and, and purposeful connections. Susan Fink, who made a connection with Rose Cano, who's long to everybody knows Rose, and, mm -hmm. um, and Chris Goodson, who's part of the host committee, who's one of our PhD students, been working his ass off for the last however many months with everybody. Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so, and the host committee. So thank you to everybody for, uh, for doing this all, and to the awesome Abigail Vega from Colorado. <laughs> So a few things. So um, I'm going to move to another one of these. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, as, as you, were, you heard, I was at New Dramatist in New York for 18 years. And the first day that I got there, before I even had started the job, I walked into the room that would be my office, because I wanted to see what my office would be like. And there was an empty space with a desk. And on the desk was an ashtray with a cigar butt. In it. And the cigar butt belonged to Eduardo Machado, a playwright some of you may know. And he was defining that space as his, even though I was coming to it. And those who know Eduardo know that this is actually true. Um, and, but it was a space that was, for me, my life and the, sp and the place, New Dramatist, was actually defined in a large way by Latino and Latina playwrights. And I just want to uh, read a list of the writers who were there for seven years each, who have um, shaped my life, and some of them are in this room. Ann Garcia Romero, Carlos Murillo, Rogelio Martinez, Naomi Azuka, Luis Alfaro, Michael John Garces, Andrea Tom, Christopher Diaz, Alejandro Morales, Nilo Cruz, Roger Durling, Sylvia Gonzalez S., who should be here, she's from Mexico <coughs> Northwest, Jorge uh, Ignacio Cortinas, uh, Chiara Hudis, uh, Eddie Sanchez, Octavio Solis, Matthew Paul Olmos, and then there were um, other people like Irene who were alumni of the place who were very important and instrumental. And so um, I bring them into this room with me because uh, they, they taught me everything about the theater. Um, uh, a thing about the space that we are in. This, <laughs> um, this is forget that camera. Forget that. Um, this is the Glenn Hughes Penthouse Theater, and the School of Drama is 75 years old this year. This theater is 75 years old. It was founded in 19. It was built in 1940 out of the WPA. And what's amazing about this building, I knew about this building before I knew about this university, because it is the oldest permanent in the round theater in America. Oh. And it was the theater that helped inspire Margot Jones in Dallas, Nina Vance in Houston, and Zelda Fitchhandler in Washington, DC, to build their arena stages. That is this building that we are in here now. And it used to be down by the water, and some deal was cut with the biology department, and they cut the building in three pieces and trucked it up to this part of the house. But this is the same building, and it's from the WPA, and that's why I think it's, it's important to know that. And part of the thing about this in the round, you know, this thing, this scheme, is that we are uh, all equal in it, and it's a town hall. Um, so uh, the last thing I want to say is related to that, because this is a community space. And, be, and I think a lot about the WPA when I think about it, and I think about the Federal Theater Project. And I believe that what we are engaged in is a third great era in the making of a national theater. And the first part was that Federal Theater Project that lasted for four years, that was pioneered by Holly Flanagan, that was meant to employ artists across the country all kinds of artists doing all kinds of work, and to build an audience, an audience for theater, an audience of millions. And that lasted for four years, and then was killed 
by the same fuckers who are now running for president. <laughs> <laughs> or their, their predecessors, excuse me. Um, uh, they're all part of a, a, an ancestry that is not the Duwamish ancestry. Right. Um, the second great era is that one in the 60s, and 50s and 60s that grew out of this arena space that is the regional theater movement. And there was a particular key moment, now I'm gonna be a history geek for a minute, there was a key moment in the early 60s when Theater Communications Group, funded by the Ford Foundation, decided to take out of its mission community and university theaters and focus on 13 professional theaters of a particular size. Oh. And now you can feel the energy at TCG for the last 20 years trying to get back to that energy. And now we're in another era that I believe began five years ago with the founding of Holland, which is the era of the commons. And what's confusing and different about the commons is that there's nobody to point to to say it's their fault when things go wrong. <laughs> there's nobody who's in charge except for us. And so everything that happens here happens because we make it happen. And everything that happens across the country happens because we make it happen. And so that is, as I understand it, our charge for this weekend it's been the charge of the Latino, Latino Theater Commons for the last three years since you gathered first in Boston and then in LA and Chicago and Dallas and now thankfully here. And this is what we're here to do. There's nobody to point to to say the, the, this, this theater, this national theater is inhospitable to any of us. We are the ones to point to. So that's our, our charge, I think. Good luck to us all. <laughs> um, and um, it, as, as Lin-Manuel Miranda uh, writes, uh, history has its eyes on it. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, now the moment you've been waiting for, which is um, <laughs> the reading of the proclamation. <laughs> I want to introduce um, one of the great uh, arts advocates, as I understand it, in this area, especially for um, uh, Latino and Latina arts and culture. Uh, Miguel Guillen is the grants uh, to or, uh, is grants to organizations program manager for the Washington State Arts Commission. He spent several years of has uh, several years experience managing arts programs for the private sector and providing support to community-based arts organizations. He is an artist himself. He, he um, supports small arts groups, community-based projects, individual artists across the state. He is also the volunteer executive director for La Sala, an organization that seeks to raise the profile of Latino and Latino artists working in Seattle and surrounding districts. Please welcome Miguel Guillen. Thanks everybody. It's an honor to be here representing the Washington State Arts Commission and an honor to be here reading the city of Seattle and for the mayor of uh, Mayor Murray, this proclamation. Uh, I can't follow up that wonderful uh, talk very well, so I'm just gonna go ahead and launch right into this proclamation because I'm eager to read it to you because I know you're eager to hear it. <laughs> um, city of Seattle proclamation. Whereas the city of Seattle has long been home to people of all cultures and national origins and draws immense strength from the, from the diversity of its citizenry, and whereas the Latino, Latina community plays a significant role in our city, which is known throughout the world for its great diversity, technology, industries, intellectual and, and talent, intellectual vitality and talent, and whereas the University of Washington School of Drama is celebrating the 75th anniversary of their nationally recognized theater training program and has chosen to partner with the Latino Latina Theater Commons, LTC, to host the 2016 LTC Pacific Northwest Regional Convening in the historic Glenn Hughes Penthouse Theater, and whereas the Pacific <laughs> Northwest has long celebrated a vibrant culture of grassroots theater, arts, and activism generated by the Latino Latina community which has led to progressive social changes, and whereas throughout its history, the, the LTC has brought Latino, Latina artists and allies together to build towards a national movement of Latino and Latina theaters 
in cities and regions across the country, including Boston, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Dallas. And whereas the city of Seattle is pleased to host the national participants of the 2016 LTC Pacific Northwest Regional Convening, and I encourage Seattle's residents and visitors to support and celebrate this partnership. Now, reading for Mayor Murray, now therefore I, Edward D. Murray, Mayor of Seattle, do hereby proclaim April 15, 2016 to be Latino Latina Dia <coughs> Birthday. <coughs> and we recognize this weekend the incredible history and growth of Latino theater here in the Pacific Northwest. Ooh. Younger companies like Ese Teatro, where's Rose? <laughs> <laughs> and Latino Theater Projects, Fernando, <laughs> have joined long-standing companies such as Milagro. Milagro. Now, when Chris and I first started researching Latino theater here in the Pacific Northwest, we were struck by the sheer number of artists and companies and productions that have come here through here over the years, including the residency and work of the incomparable Maria Irene Fornes. In the next hour, we're going to present a brief overview of the legacy of Latino theater here in the Pacific Northwest, as well as present short readings from five of Fornes' plays as a tribute to her, the work that she did here. Unfortunately, it's impossible to recognize all of the artists that have come here through the years, but we felt it was important to recognize and honor the collective multi-generational efforts of artists in this region. Now I'm going to work the bombs. <laughs> 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 the Pacific Northwest has a long and rich history of Latino and indigenous peoples. The Latino community represents the largest non-Caucasian population in the entire Pacific Northwest. Here in Seattle, the demographic has increased more than 30% in, in the last six years. And in King County alone, more than 100,000 residents speak Spanish. In 1970, one of the first guerrilla-style theater groups started here in Seattle, Teatro del Kyoko, <laughs> <laughs> formed right here at the University of Washington by Tomas Ibarra Frasto and Alda Cisneros Mendoza. <laughs> the group was influenced by the farm workers' movement of the 1960s and 70s that had reached Washington's Yakima Valley. Visits to Seattle by Cesar Chavez and Teatro Campesino had a major impact on the group, and Teatro del Piojo developed many of their own actos, depicting power struggles both on the fields and off. In 1972, UW alumni Ruben Sierra took the leadership role, and he became one of the most influential Latino artists here in the Pacific Northwest in that time. Los Piojos performed in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Utah, in campos, community halls, picket lines, prisons, and universities. And they also hosted the first stop in the Tenaz Festival in 1975. Now, before I turn this over to Chris, I want to touch upon the name Teatro del Piojo. <laughs> the name Theater of the Lice refers, <laughs> <laughs> refers to the degrading process experienced by Chicano children when their teachers would search their ha hair for lice before classroom lessons would even begin. Now, the group chose this symbol as a base upon which to build something better. From a negative image of the past, something positive will arise. <coughs> From whatever bad things are spoken against them, they will use those words and create something good. <coughs> the two 
cherry trees outside the old New City Theater building on Seattle's Capitol Hill were dedicated to Carmen Collado de Fornes on her 100th birthday in May 1991, with both Irene and her mother present at the dedication. Wow. Don Jose Carrillo, our actor and poet, played the flute on that occasion 25 years ago. Although it was written at the time that the bronze plaques would serve as permanent reminders to the Puget Sound community of Fornes' special interest in and unique influence of theater in this area, the plaques are now gone. In fact, the old theater, once a funeral home, is destined to be demolished later this year, and it is uncertain whether or not Carmen's trees will be preserved. Now, in that building between 1988 and 1993, Fornes conducted four writing workshops with over 50 local writers and directed her plays, Fefu and Her Friends, Mud, and Enter the Night. Now, maybe worth stating at this point um, that one of the goals of the Commons is to, quote, transform the narrative of American theater. Now, the artists who have directed tonight's scenes chose to present exclusively the work of Irene Fornes, not only because of her commitment to the development of Latina and Latino writers, but also because their own personal connection to her work over the years in our region. Now, while it's outside the scope of this event to transform the narrative of Irene Fornes, what we are perhaps attempting to do tonight is fill in certain gaps in her legacy as an artist. For instance, although Fornes made numerous trips to Seattle in premiering one of her final works here, scant records of the personal history of this appear in the handful of books on Fornes. And when her work does appear in the record, it is often little more than a footnote here. And sometimes those footnotes are inaccurate. Kai Gottberg, an award-winning playwright, NEA fellow, and now chair of the Performing Arts Department at Seattle University, attended all of Fornes's workshops at New City, as well as three in Padua Hills, becoming close friends with the playwright and often visiting her in New York. Kai played the role of Emma in Fornes's production of Feku in 1989, <coughs> and after a separation of the play, uh, from the play of 27 years, she recently directed it at Seattle University. When I asked her about Irene's legacy in the Pacific Northwest, Godberg, who, like Fornes, also moved away from the isolating nature of being a visual artist, spoke passionately about Fornes' teaching method, which she continues with her own <coughs> students today. She said, Irene had found this really beautiful way of making writing less lonely and being in the mix with other people and letting their ideas infect and influence your own work. Irene was such a champion of a purity of intent, and a purity of vision, that you just felt like, of course that's what I want to do. Of course that's what I want to be. And in a world that is so focused on the commercial, and the theater world that is so focused on what's my next job, and how much money am I gonna get, and does anybody know my name, it was refreshing and exciting to be around someone like her, obviously so focused on the transcendental nature of being a creator. The beauty of Irene always was, you need to stop thinking you know how the world is organized, because that is death in the theater. Here to present act two, scene one, from Faithful and Her Friends, are the performers <coughs> Maggie Carrillo Adams and Angela Maestas. They have been directed by Roy Arraus. of potatoes, carrots, beets, winter squash, and other vegetables from a root cellar and put them in a small wagon. Beppu wears a hat and gardening gloves. Do you think about genitals all the time? Genitals? No, I don't think about genitals all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I do, and it drives me crazy. Each person I see in the street, anywhere at all, keep thinking of their genitals, uh, what they look like, the position that they're in. I think it's odd that everyone has them, don't you? <coughs> no, I think it'd be odder if they didn't have them. <laughs> I mean, people act as if they don't have genitals. <laughs> how do people with genitals act? <laughs> I mean, how can businessmen and women stand in a room and discuss business without even one reference to their genitals? I mean, everybody has them. They just pretend like they don't. <laughs> 
<laughs> I see. You mean we should do this all the time? No. I don't mean that. Think of it. Don't you think I'm right? <laughs> yes, I think you're right. Oh, Emma, 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 Emma. That's my name. Well, you see, it's generally believed that you go to heaven if you're good, and if you're bad, you go to hell. That is correct. However, in heaven, they don't judge goodness the way you think. They don't. They have a divine registry of sexual performance. <laughs> in that registry, they mark down every little sexual activity in your life. If your faith is not entirely in it, if you just perform as an obligation, and you don't feel the most profound devotion for your spirit, heart, and your flesh is not religiously delivered to it, you're condemned. <laughs> they put you down in the blacklist, and you don't go to heaven. <laughs> heaven is populated with divine lovers. And in hell, live the dead. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> I knew you'd feel that way. Oh, I do. I do. <laughs> you see, on Earth, we are judged by public acts, and sex is a private act. The partner cannot be said to be the public since both partners are engaged. So naturally, it stands to reason that it's angels who judge our sexual life. <laughs> naturally. You always bring joy to me. Thank you. I thank you. I am in constant pain. I don't want to give in to it. If I do, I'm afraid I will never recover. It's not physical, and it's not sorrow. It's very strange, Emma. And I, I can't describe it. It's, it's very frightening. It is as if normally there's a lubricant, but not, a, not in the body, <laughs> a spiritual lubricant. And without it, life is a nightmare. And everything is distorted. A black cat started coming into my kitchen. He's awfully mangled and big. He's, he's missing an eye and his, his skin is diseased. At first I was repelled by him. But then I thought, this is a monster who was sent to me. <coughs> and I must feed him. And I fed him. One day he came and shat all over my kitchen. Foul diarrhea everywhere. He still comes. And I still feed him. I'm afraid of him. How about some lemonade? Yes. How about a game of croquet? Fine. <laughs> Not from the stars do I my judgment pluck, and yet methinks I have astronomy. But not to tell of good or evil luck, of plagues and dirts or seasons' quality. Nor can I fortune two brief minutes tell, pointing to each thunder, rain, and wind, or say with princes, if it shall go well, I oft predict that I in heaven find. But from thine eyes my knowledge I derive, and constant stars in them I read such art. As beauty, truth shall together thrive, if from thyself to store thou wouldst convert. Or else of thee this I prognosticate, thy end is truth's, and beauty is doom and date. Although not strictly a Latino institution, it would be impossible to speak about the movement in Seattle without mentioning the group theater co-founded by Ruben Sierra and others in 1978. Of their debut production of Short Eyes by Miguel Pinheiro, critics remarked the production was searing and powerful, a play that was impossible to forget with a tough and memorable bunch of performers. And with that, the group began. And for the next 20 years, they produced regional and world premieres of plays by Lisa Loomer, Jorge Huerta, Milcha Sanchez Scott, Jose Rivera, 
Diane, Ro Diane Rodriguez, and many others. At their original location, just a few blocks west of here, at the university's ethnic cultural center, local audiences saw for the first time plays like Marisol, Real Women Have Curves, Roosters, Volcón, not to mention the great number of Latino and Latino actors and directors, some of whom are here tonight. But with that said, we also shouldn't mischaracterize the nature, the vision, or the people who made up Seattle's group theater. In their effort to educate the general public as to the basic compatibility of all ethnic groups, the company also produced work by Derek Walcott, Apple Fugard, Philip Kanzatanda, Ping Chong, Enshizaki Shange, Maxim Gorky, Talvin Wilkes, and Eugenia Chan. And if that list doesn't sound radically diverse enough, they also did You Can't Take It With You. <laughs> As their artistic director Tim Bond wrote, the group's multi-ethnic effort to challenge audiences to see their own lives reflected in the plays of another culture was always going to be an uphill climb in Seattle. There are some people who just don't want us around, he wrote. That's why we started our own thing. <coughs> Emerging from the group's world premiere of Jose Cruz Gonzalez's Harvest Moon was the independent Teatro Latino. Described by Olga Sanchez as a grassroots organization of Latino artists that produced work on a project by project basis, the company produced not only plays, but original ritualistic performances that incorporated archetypes and poetry, a practice that ultimately led to Seattle's Dia de los Muertos annual celebration. Perhaps the crowning achievement of Teatro Latino however, was the creation of the bilingual children's show Retratos Lindos, pretty pictures, that was toured to regional libraries and where hundreds of school children saw their first glimpse of theatricalized tales from Latin America. Community-engaged efforts like this were, in the words of Jose Carrillo, meant to tear down the temple of the bureaucratic establishments <coughs> that run the commercialized theater. When Ruben Sierra passed away at the age of 51 in 1998, the very same year that the group shut its doors, the Seattle Times ran an obituary. In addition to praising the visionary actor, director, professor, and mentor, the article had concluded that the multicultural practices that Sierra and the group theater began had become, quote, so common that its specialty was no longer needed. Mm. <laughs> One reader took particular exception to this assessment, writing, after reading his obituary, I just had to respond. Mr. Sierra's practices had become so common that the group's specialty was no longer needed? It may be common elsewhere, but here in Seattle, the group's demise has left a gaping cultural gap in our artistic scene. Thank you. And to what extent the cultural gap left by the group's demise still has yet to be filled is hopefully part of the many conversations that will begin at this convening. <laughs> first produced in 1983 at the Padua Hills Playwrights <coughs> Festival in California. And then it was produced here in Seattle by New City Theater in 1990 and again last year in 2015. The play follows the lives of the overworked May, her companion Lloyd, and the literate Henry, and their dysfunctional love triangle as May struggles to educate herself and escape the mud of her world and die clean. Mud bears its themes of poverty, class divisions, emotional and sexual domination, and the violence that these can inflict upon a person's soul. Many critics tend to focus on the despair found in the play, but Fornes actually claims that Mud is the opposite. She said May's hope at the beginning of the play is an example of what is possible. Horn has received an Obie Award for writing and directing Mud, one of the nine that she received throughout her career. And when she first started working on Mud, Marie, uh, Marie Irene didn't even know where the setting would be. She uh, arrived in California for rehearsals, and the play hadn't even been written. So for the auditions, she decided that she would just write one good scene, so that way the actors thought that there was a play behind it. <laughs> <laughs> The next day, she went to a local flea market, and she saw an axe and a pitchfork, and she immediately knew that the play should be set in the country. She saw Lloyd working the land, and May standing at her ironing board. The play had revealed itself to her. Rose Hanno, artistic director of Ese Teatro, first met Irene in 1984, when she came here to workshop a play at the Seattle Rep. 
Rose wanted a Spanish translation of mud because she thought the play's themes would fit the contemporary reality present in the class divisions in urban and rural Lima, Peru. In 1990, Rose translated mud into bottle for the first Young Directors Festival in Lima. She kept a pure translation and only changed one word, axe to machete. Mm -hmm. For those of you who know the Peruvian history, yes, that is very significant. The play was remounted in 1991 with the support of the cultural arm of the U.S. Embassy in Peru, and Rose and her own writing, uh, for Rose and her own writing, Mud, along with Fornes' other plays, signified the connection between North and South, and Baro was the exchange between the two hemispheres. And now, performers Fernando Cavallo, Sophie Franco, and Marco Boli will present a scene from Baro, directed and translated by Rose Cano. Les dije que estás enfermo y les dije lo que tienes. ¿Qué dijeron? Dijeron que tienes que ir. Tienes que ir a la clínica. Ellos no te dan medicina hasta que vayas. No voy a ir. Ellos tienen que hacerte un análisis. Ellos no te pueden dar medicina hasta que saben lo que tienes. Ellos dijeron que puede ser algo malo. ¿Qué? Ellos no dijeron. Me dieron este libro. ¿Qué dice? No puedo leerlo. Intenté, pero no puedo. Conseguí a Henry para que te lo lea. Está fuera. ¿Por qué no puedes leerlo tú? Es muy difícil. Tanto tiempo estudiando y no puedes leer. Intenté leerlo y es muy difícil. Por eso conseguí a Henry para que te lo lea. Es muy difícil para mí. Es, es avanzado. Y yo no soy avanzada todavía, soy intermedia. Yo puedo leer bastantes cosas. Pero eso no puedo leer. Por eso no pasa nada. Me hubiese gustado que tú lo leas. A mí también. Me hubiese gustado leer. Pasa, Henry. Siéntate, Henry. Casa Henry el hoy. <risa> Él te lo va a leer. ¿Has estado tomando? <risa> Está enfermo. Tiene fiebre. ¿Qué tiene? Está mal. <risa> Acuérdate de Ronnie. Lo que le pasó a Ronnie. ¿Qué le pasó? Se murió. ¿Y de qué se murió? Me dio hasta morir. Le, le falló su hígado. ¡Ajá! ¿Por qué le falló su hígado? Alcohol. ¿Por qué bebía? Bebía porque era dueño de alcohol. ¿Y por qué era dueño de alcohol? Porque era dueño de una farmacia. ¿Y por qué eso llevó a un hombre a beber? porque guardaba alcohol en la farmacia. Allí tienes dos cosas, alcohol y nada que hacer. Entonces, ¿qué pasa? Bebes hasta morir. Entonces, ¿tienes alcohol? Lo tomas. ¿No tienes alcohol? No lo tomas. ¿Tienes plata para comprar alcohol? Lo compras. ¿No tienes plata? No lo compras. ¿El hoy tiene alcohol, Maya? Él no tiene plata para comprarlo. Ah, si el hoy tuviese plata, sería un borracho. <risa> sí, no sería. Si no es borracho, si no es borracho es porque es pobre. No es. Este es el libro. Prostatitis y prostatosis. 
infección bacterial de la próstata crónica y aguda. Síntomas, diagnosis y tratamiento. Síntomas comunes de prostatitis aguda y prostatosis bacterial son enfermedad febril, dolor de espalda, dolor perineal, orina irritativa, dolor de perineo, dolor sexual, impotencia sexual, eyaculación dolorosa intermitente disuria o eyaculación con sangre. ¿Qué quiere decir eso? No sé lo que quiere decir. Estos son términos médicos. Necesita estudio. Esto tal vez requiere un uso de un diccionario. Un diccionario especial. Uno que tiene términos médicos. Términos técnicos. Seguramente el diccionario tendría todo tipo de términos científicos. Desde términos de construcción a ingeniería hasta términos científicos como física. Hay diccionarios así. <risa> Parece un chavo el hoy. Está hinchado. Está hinchado. Y tu color está mal. Muy bien, tu lengua el hoy. Su lengua está blanca y su aliento huele mal. ¿Qué tienes? Yo quiero que vaya al doctor, pero no va. ¿Por qué no vas al doctor el hoy? No quiero ir. Se va a quedar acá pudriéndose. No me voy a pudrir. Yo te dije que iría contigo. Tú me dijiste que no podía ir. Él quería ir con un machete. Él es un animal. No vas a la clínica con un machete. No puedes hacer eso. ¿Por qué harías eso, Eloy? No lo hice. Nunca fui. Sí, apesta. Se está pudriendo, se lo no va a decir nada. Ponte a acabar tu tumba mientras puedas, Eloy. Porque yo no te lo voy a hacer. Ya le dije que encuentra un sitio y cabe. Si se necesita una persona fuerte para acabar tal mundo, yo no lo puedo hacer. Ni lo haría si pudiera. ¿Quieres pan, Henry? Tenemos mantequilla. Sí. Gracias. ¿Quieres comer? Tenemos sopa. Sí. Gracias. Quédate entonces. Todavía no lo he empezado. Sí. Lo haré. Audience bases were developed, 
and actors were trained who were fluent in Spanish. Eventually, full-length plays were produced once a year for Spanish-speaking audiences. Milagro saw these productions as one more way of breaking down cultural barriers and as a way to make an inviting space for all members of the Latino community. As Jose describes, Milagro is not just a theater, it's a family. Now, Oregon is also home to a significant ally of Latino theater, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Is Christopher Acebo here? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, <laughs> OSF is an active producer of Latino, Asian, and African American works and implements a diverse and inclusive theater initiative under the leadership of artistic director Bill Rausch. In the last 10 years, the company has produced five Latino penned world premieres and four to five non-world premieres and recently implemented the Latino Play Project as a way of cultivating Latino playwrights and showcasing the plays. With leadership positions filled by Christopher, Luis Alfaro, and many others, OSF works towards having <coughs> ethnic diversity represented not just on stage, but at the administrative level, which is crucial. This results in thoughtful conversations about some of today's hot topics, season selection, and casting practices. As Christopher says, the OSF subscribes to a matrix of casting philosophies specifically based for each show color conscious casting practices, not color blind, and racially open casting practices are thoughtfully considered. As a result, when Latino actors are hired, the actors are cast across the entire season, avoiding the all too common practice of pigeonholing Latino artists. On average, five to 12 Latino actors are cast in multiple shows for each season. OSF and Milagro have both succeeded as long-standing theater organizations that continually earn the trust of Latina and Latino artists and audiences by valuing the art that comes from the community and providing a collaborative space for it to be showcased. The only time that John Kazanjian, the artistic director of Seattle's New City Theater, ever said no to Irene Fornes is when the playwright wanted to cut a hole in the ceiling of his theater for the world premiere for 1993 play Enter the Night. <laughs> and so honoring this wish meant that he would not only have to cut apart the lighting grid, um, but also demolish a section of the asbestos layered ceiling. Kazanjian felt that a first time no was indeed in order. Uh, after all, as per his policy to give invited artists quote unquote total creative freedom, Fornes had already cut a 10 foot by 10 foot hole in the theater floor <laughs> so the actors could ascend from the basement during the action. Uh, although Irene was displeased <laughs> with John, uh, this aesthetic compromise was, only, was the only conflict the company ever really had during their many collaborations with the playwright, an artist to whom visual and pictorial aesthetics often meant more than anything. Not only was their long relationship extremely fruitful, the more remarkable fact may be that if it hadn't been for the work of Fornes, there may not have been a new city theater at all in Seattle. Mary Ewald, featured here, for those of you who can see, and John Kazanjian first came out from New York because Mary had been cast as Julia in the Northwest premiere of Fefu and Her Friends in 1981, a role she would later play under Fornes' direction. Now Mary consequently booked a gig at Seattle's Intamon Theater. John had the opportunity to take over a space that would become New City, and the couple stayed in Seattle, where they have, over the course of 35 years, hosted the likes of Richard Foreman, Len Jenkin, Kristen Cosmas, Stephen Jesse Bernstein, Susan Laurie Parks, and countless other playwrights, filmmakers, poets, and performers. Now this award-winning artistic duo uh, are unfortunately unable to be here tonight, but I think they have a rather legitimate excuse. As Seattle's oldest experimental theater, they are currently producing The Tempest with Mary Ewald, now well into her 60s, alternating nightly the roles of Prospero and Caliban. Mm -hmm. While that's another legacy that has yet to be written, I will simply tell you what Mary told me about her experience working with Irene. As an actor, she learned to just, quote, strip it away, strip it away, strip it away. 
And how much are you willing to just strip it away, trust the words, trust the exterior vision and choreography that Irene has layered upon it? She awakened to trust in my own instincts without having to over-rationalize everything. She works from such a deeply extinct, instinctual and subconscious place of her own that if you can kind of let her material wash over you and not try to control it in any rational way, kind of trust the ride and where it's going to take you, you can leave yourself open to be surprised by what's happening to you on stage, which is a wonderful thing as an actor, to allow yourself to explore something in real time in front of an audience and not have to feel that everything is worked out. In her review of the world premiere of Enter the Night, <coughs> featured here, which Ford has wrote with Mary Ewald in mind, one critic speculated on how much of the power of the production was due to Fornes's direction. Quote, certainly a great deal would be missing without the stylized choreography of the mind scenes. And given the sparseness of the dialogue, the direction of the play's elusive visual language seems crucial. While the final mo structure of the play remains dreamlike and open-ended as a succession of haunting moments rather than a progressive march, it possesses considerable cumulative power. Here to present a scene from Enter the Night are Veronica Nunez, Amalia Alarcón Morris, and Roberto Astorga. They have come up from Portland, Oregon, and have been directed by Melda Reyes. So, how are things with you? All right, I suppose. The same? What do you mean? I'm not well, but I don't pay any attention to it. What's wrong? I pretend I'm well. No one has told me that I'm well, but I act as if I am. <laughs> as if I've been told by a doctor that I'm well, and I can go ahead and do whatever I want. Well, I haven't been told that. If I stop taking my heart medicine, I'll die. Paula. Yes? I keep doing the work on the farm, and, and I keep saying it's not going to harm me. I keep saying it. But there's a voice inside me that tells me, you keep doing what you're doing, you're gonna die. The next shovel you push through the earth could kill you. This is good for me, if I carry a sack of feed. This has got to be good for me. I can't just stand there and let everything I've worked for <coughs> go to waste, and sit and let the animals lie in their own manure uncared for, let them starve and die. <coughs> I can't do that. I can't just let my meadows go to waste. I can't sit there and watch the weeds take over and do nothing. That's not the way I am. I'd rather die. I don't want to be different from the way I am. <coughs> I don't want to be a different person just to stay alive. If the person I am dies, then I die. <laughs> it's, it's a, a Russian, Russian roulette, roulette, says the voice. Every time we climb a ladder, or pick up a bag of feed, or a bucket, or a bucket of, manure, of manure, it can, can be, be the, last. the last. They wanted to fuck me. <laughs> and they did. They fucked me until I was blue in the face. One first, and then another, and another, and they came back. They couldn't get enough, and I wanted all they had. They didn't use condoms, nothing. <laughs> Didn't they? Didn't they, Jack? On the raw. I told them I was HIV positive. You are not. Why do you think you are? They didn't care. Why did you say that? Why, Jack? I did. Why did you say that? And I handed them condoms. <sighs> Jack. And they didn't take them. They said they had more pleasure without them. Did they know what a condom is? I was bleeding like a faucet. And they fucked me. And fucked me. Oh, 
Jack. And it hurt like the devil. And I screamed. I screamed till I was blue. I could, I screamed until I couldn't scream anymore. And they kept fucking me. One after the other. Did you think you were giving them AIDS? And I never got so much pleasure in my life. <laughs> I had any condoms. And they didn't care. And I never been so happy in my life. One big cock after the other. I scraped like a goat in the slaughterhouse. I don't know. I don't know. Did I think? It's a virus. It happened when I got fucked by someone. When you get a cold, do you wonder who gave it to you? No one gave it to me. I got it. Maybe I got it when I got the best fuck in my life. <laughs> and then maybe I got it when I got a lousy fuck. So what? Oh. Don't touch me! You don't have AIDS. Don't touch me. Why does he say he has AIDS? <laughs> I'm contentious. Yeah, Jack, you don't have AIDS. I don't want to give you AIDS. Why does he say that? Stop it, Jack, stop it. I have AIDS. You don't have AIDS. And if you did, you would never do what, it, what you say you did. I am contentious. Jack, you would never do that. I have AIDS. Jack. You have to protect yourself. I have AIDS! You don't have AIDS! I have AIDS! You don't have AIDS! You yes. are not HIV positive! Yes, I am! You have to be careful. No. Remember. <coughs> what should I remember? that you don't have AIDS. You have been tested. Why do you think you have AIDS? You don't have AIDS, you don't. I have seen your test. You are not. You are not. Because, explores Irene's legacy within the work of contemporary Latino playwrights and Garcia Romero has identified what she terms the Fornes Frame. Thank you for your wonderful book. This Fornes Frame, a way of understanding these new Latino works through a framework that examines cultural multiplicity, supernatural invention, aesthetic experimentation, and the complexity of Latina identity. All elements gifted to us by the work of Irene. Now, as we take these last few moments to consider the regional movement as it is today, let's take a, that frame and touch on the work of Rose Conner. Many of you know Rose, of course, is the artistic director of Seattle's Essay Teatro, but Rose herself is also a playwright. And I would suggest that her play, Don Quixote, Homeless in Seattle, would meet the criteria for the Fornes frame. And you can correct me on all of this if I'm wrong later. The play is Rose's examination of her experience experiences as a professional interpreter with homeless individuals who navigate the complex system of healthcare in the city of Seattle. 
not in any way an essentialized look at Latino culture, but one that through a reinterpretation of Cervantes' multi-generic structure seeks to illuminate the realities of homelessness as it really is in our city today. And this was tinged with the supernatural as the main character's hallucinations originating in what appear to be chronic inebriation eventually deteriorate into a nightmarish state where reality and delirium blend. Now add to this the explore, exploration of cultural multiplicity through characters who also embody real life figures from the indigenous Dittitat and Duwamish communities. And the most powerful moment in this process, according to company member Meg Savlov, occurred in the play's initial workshops conducted with audiences at Seattle's Tent City for the Homeless. In the talk back after the performance, one community member stood up and said to the cast, gracias por hacernos sentir que somos visibles. Thank you for making us feel that we are visible. Mm. Now, equally as significant in our city now is the Latino Theater Projects, founded in 2011 by Fernando Luna and Robert Harkins, this group is focused on the creation of what they term teatro útil, or useful theater, engaging in a wide variety of community-centered projects at both the artistic and educational level. Now, this vision is critical to the contemporary moment, and there may be an echo of the formulas <coughs> framed here in the philosophy of Fernando Luna, who writes, although progress has been made in improving the visibility of Latinos in the arts, this community is still woefully underrepresented, and this is especially true in theater. What we are missing are positive portrayals of Latinos as they actually live their lives and the richness of contemporary Latino culture. And to that end, the primary purpose of Latino theater projects is to produce plays from Latin America and the Caribbean presenting diverse cultural worlds that allow theater audiences to more fully understand the Latino and Latina experience in the 21st century. And we also believe in doing plays where women are empowered protagonist figures in the stories we are telling. play, Letters from Cuba, was commissioned for the 1999-2000 season at the Signature Theater in New York City. This is from a staged reading that was done at UC Berkeley last year. In my research, I actually couldn't find any evidence of a full-length production done here at, in, in the Pacific Northwest. I'm looking around for confirmation. <laughs> um, and if, I, if you, your theater did do one, I apologize. I'll buy you a drink after. <laughs> um, this special play draws from Irene's personal experiences as a Cuban-American immigrant. The play follows its protagonist, Fran, a young Cuban dancer living in New York who regularly exchanges letters with her brother, Luis, who remains in Havana. Through their circumstances, Irene examines the impact of both Fran and Luis's separate lives on their family and on each other. When, letter, when Letters from Cuba premiered, the New York Times described it as quietly beautiful. Sally Porterfield explains the appeal of Fornes's work in observing that the universe of Fornes's artistic imagination seems to be formed by a distillation of universal experience. When we meet these archetypal characters and situations within the strange and exotic world of her drama, it becomes an eerily unexpected and moving encounter. Now, as a result, Fornes herself has been described by critics and scholars as one of the best kept secrets of American theater. Uh huh. Oh, okay. for us, <laughs> it's no secret to us how special her storytelling is. I think Fornes actually best summarized her own work and its impact when she explained one is inspired by seeing other people inspired by seeing other people working. Seeing people looking at a painting and you say, I was going to walk by. What is it that these people are interested in and I'm not? And that's when you start to look and you begin to notice the details the painter has made and you begin to pay attention. As we gather theater artists from near and far, we wanted to honor Maria Irene Fornes and the time she spent here in Seattle and like the painting that she talked about, to notice and celebrate the details of the work performed by Latina and Latino artists here in the Pacific Northwest, and to recognize their <coughs> contributions as part of a much larger canvas. Now, 
performer Erwin Delan will present a scene from Letters from Cuba directed by Fernanda Luna. How does one write a poem? I've been writing poetry. I've been saying words in my head to see if words, spirits would come and join with other words that were there. If they would do that, then maybe they would come in and form a poem. I think that's how poems get written. I don't think we write them, I mean. Poems are difficult. We can do easy things, but difficult ones? They come to us by themselves. It's just that to learn to listen to them is difficult. We have to learn to listen and let them come in easy, as if the words would come out by themselves because they want to make a poem because they desire to make a poem. As if the words had desires and they want to join with other words to express something of beauty, of longing, or of despair. Oye, Francisquita! Oye, ¿tú te acuerdas cuando tú nos visitaste? Y nos trajiste todos los tipos de comida. Comida seca, que sabía bien bueno cuando le añadías agua. Y comida en lata. Y, y tú nos pediste disculpas, porque tú dijiste, mira, la comida en lata no es tan buena como la comida fresca, pero es que no puedo entrar la comida fresca por la aduana. Y, y, y nosotros te vinimos, no, pero... A nosotros nos gusta la comida en lata. Y tú pensaste que estábamos siendo bien educados, porque eso era lo que habías traído. Pero no, de verdad. A nosotros nos gustó la comida en lata. ¿Sabes? Tenía un sabor así, un sabor americano, como a, como a hoja de lata. Y cuando lo comíamos, sentíamos que estábamos en los Estados Unidos, y que hablábamos inglés, y decíamos, hey, how are you? Eh? Oh, oh, thank you. Eh, hey, what is your name? Do you speak Spanish? Pero también era bueno porque las latas la tomábamos y, y usábamos como vaso para tomar agua o como cazuelas para calentar el agua para el café y también para guardar comida y lo poníamos en el refrigerador y también tomábamos otras latas y le hacíamos huecos y la usábamos como macetas para cultivar plantas cultivábamos eh, habichuelas hasta café no mucho, porque tú sabes, era pequeñito. Pero eh, estaba buenísimo, buenísimo. Y otra, y otra lata sin huecos la pusimos en el techo para colectar agua cuando llovía. Porque tú sabes, mami le gusta lavarse el pelo por agua de lluvia. Y yo guardaba otra en el cuarto mío y, y la pegaba así con una cucharita. Así, cuando tocaba música con el conjunto. Y también teníamos una lata de sardina. Y le poníamos una vela. Y cuando se apagaba la luz. Mami prendía la vela. Tú ves, te damos gracias por la luz. Y cuando tú viniste nos daba pena porque se iba la electricidad cada noche, y te pedimos disculpas, y tú nos dijiste, no, no hay problema, mira lo bonito que se ve la sala, cuando todo está oscuro, y solo se ve la luz de la vela, y nosotros miramos, y nos dimos cuenta, que tenías razón, se veía muy bonito, y, y nosotros nos veíamos bien elegantes, <risa> tú nos dijiste, que es que así, es que se iluminan los restaurantes de lujo en Nueva York y en París también. Y eso nos alentó. 
Y, 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 y luego, eh, ¿qué pasó? Ya se me estaba olvidando. <risa> That's all I'm going to say about it. <laughs> because after all, Maria Irene Forna is always extremely skeptical of academic criticism, <laughs> um, said this. To say that a work of art is meaningful is to imply that the work is endowed with intelligence, that it is illuminated. But if we must inquire what the meaning of a work of art is, it becomes evident that the work has failed us. A true work of art is a magic thing. To comprehend magic, we must be in a state of innocence of credulity. If there is wisdom in the work, it will come to us. And here again is Jose Carrillo interpreting the waiter from the Daniel. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> um, one of uh, Farnes's uh, kind of uh, usual techniques for developing character is uh, the monologue. And sometimes people just uh, monologue to teach, to lecture, uh, and for a lot of other reasons, sometimes not even explicable, as in this case. Uh, this scene here is uh, Budapest uh, in around the 1980s, uh, during the waning years of communism. Uh, there are a lot of shortages in the community, and not too much food. Uh, and the scene is uh, in a neighborhood restaurant, which is barely making it. They hardly have anything. Uh, on the menu and nothing in the kitchen. But uh, these two uh, people, a couple from America, come in looking for an inexpensive meal. They have whatever is offered and then they pay up and just as they're about to leave, the waiter uh, uh, inexplicably stands up and delivers a monologue. <laughs> and the two other characters just kind of freeze and watch him. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the way he goes. Uh, he gets paid off and says, ah, thank you. <clears throat> We're concerned with quality. <laughs> that which is lasting. Craftsmanship. A theme of quality always ends up being heavy. We have preferred quality to anything else. We wish for things that last, but we tire of them. We are buried under the stones of buildings, iron grates, heavy shoes, woolen garments, heavy sheets, Foods that smell potent, like the caves in the black forest. Hands that cut, knead, saw, and measure, and chisel, and sweat into everything we see. Pots that are too heavy to use. Shoes that delay our walk. Sheets that make our sleep a slumber. Americans sleep light and wake up briskly. You create life each day. <laughs> Here, the little trousers a boy wears to school are waiting for him at the store before he's born. <laughs> and we are dark. Americans are bright. You crave mobility, the car, 
You move from city to city so as not to grow stale. You don't stay too long in a place. A person who lives too long in the same place is suspect. <laughs> someone who's held back. Fiction, he's a stone polished mobility. You're alert. You get in and out of cars limberly. Oh, that's your grace. Our grace is weighty. Not yours. You worship the long leg and lose hip joint. How else to jump in and out of cars? <laughs> you dress light. You travel light. You're light on your feet. You are light-hearted, and a light heart is a pump that brings you to motion. You aim to alight, to throw the load overboard. Alight the flight. <laughs> You are responsible. <laughs> That's not a burden. You're responsible to things that move forward. You're responsible to the young, not so much to the old. The old do not move forward. Yeah, you'll find a way for the old to move forward. Have them join you in the thrust. <laughs> Solving a problem is not a burden for you. A problem solved is the lifting of a burden. Egyptians. Lifted heavy stones to build monuments. You lift them to get rid of heavy stones. <laughs> get rid of them. Obstacles. Ah, uh, you're efficient. You simplify life. Paperwork. Your forms are shorter. So is your period of obligation. <laughs> Work. Your hours are shorter, and you have more time to sit on the lawn <laughs> in your cotton trousers. <laughs> Thank you. So many of us about the power of the theater, the power of language, the power of character, the power of what is possible in the theater. Um, I just want to say a few words tonight as we close. I know it's been a long day and we've had a, w a wonderful evening this evening. Um, for me, the words that jumped out at me tonight in the readings were spiritual lubricant, <laughs> <laughs> teaching us how to read, staying alive. Seeing how much we've learned from you. And we wish for things that last. Um, I want to just read a couple of uh, short um, parts of my, my new book that was mentioned. Um, just in that, I reflect upon Irene, Irene's legacy. And um, tonight we were told by the wonderful Todd London, who is somewhere. There he is! <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that this uh, historic theater is. Uh, one of the first in this nation, and this school is now 75 years old. As of next month, the Latina, Latino Theater Commons is five years old. Woo. Five years old. <laughs> we are at the beginning of a 75 and hopefully longer <coughs> year legacy. Yeah? Irene Fornes turns 86 uh, this spring. And um, so I offer these reflections uh, for all of us and, and to her. Um, after graduation from graduate school, I briefly worked for Pornes as a typist. It's true. Oh. 
One afternoon, we were sitting in Greenwich Village and we ran into playwright Nilo Cruz, her former student. I witnessed how Fornes' presence elicited joyful reverence from this acclaimed writer who would become, several years later, the first Latino to win the Pulitzer Prize in drama. While I watched her graciously reconnect with Cruz, I was reminded of Fornes' stature and influence. Afterwards, we discussed my discouragement over a workshop production of one of my plays. Fornes asked me, did you learn one new thing? Yes, I replied. I learned that my main, my main character needs to express a deeper level of honesty toward the end of her journey in act two. She affirmed, good, then you did your job. As we left the, the cafe, she could see that my spirits had lifted. She then pronounced, we should have a parade <laughs> celebrating, <laughs> celebrating playwrights. <laughs> playwrights unite. <laughs> and we marched on 7th Avenue <laughs> arm in arm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just close with this one reflection. If the Fornes frame is the frame of a door, we have one door here, one here, one here, one here, and many metaphorical doors all around us. If we continue to walk through the artistic, theatrical, and professional portals of Fornes and all these Latina, and Latino theater artists in this room and her students and all playwrights have opened for us through their remarkable plays as they raise awareness of the vibrant and diverse field of Latina and Latino theater. May we continue to have a remarkable weekend together. Adelante, si se puede.